calculate um, those minutes into a VO2. Um, <coughs> I thought that was interesting because I've been reading an ECHO reports for five years, um, patient's exercise tolerance by modified Bruce protocol, and I just learned kind of what that meant. <laughs> um, so they have to have a low VO2 max. And of course, there's other sort of overarching risks versus benefits for patients. Um, somebody who might be able to be transplanted more quickly, so maybe a smaller adult um, with non-blood type O can get a heart faster than other patients. Uh, maybe you wouldn't put an LVAT in. Um, somebody with many previous cardiac surgeries might not be the best candidate. Um, Somebody who can't be on blood thinners, can't have an outback because you need to be on blood thinners. Just some other sort of things to consider. So over the last 30 years, um, there's been some pretty, uh, like with everything else, big developments and uh, making the pumps better. They went from pulsatile flow to continuous flow. 95% um, of all the implanted devices today are continuous flow devices. Um, the pulsatile flow devices had many more parts and many more things that could go wrong or malfunction. So there's fewer complications with the continuous flow models. Um, they become smaller, so they can be implanted into smaller people, including kids. Um, that would totally freak me out. Anyone okay. seen a peds LVAT? Okay, that's good. Um, more quiet, and they went from outside the body, like big machines outside the body, to inside the body, allowing patients to go home with the devices um, and improve quality of life. So now people might come into your ER with, from home with a problem. In terms of the parts, so generally the pump is siphoning blood and pumping blood from the left ventricle to the, to the aorta, taking away the reliance on the native cardiac activity of the patient. Um, oh, sorry. Um, these are two types of pumps. On the left is an axial pump where there's streamlined blood flow, and on the right there's um, a centrifugal pump where um, the blood flow goes perpendicular when it, to the way it comes in. And then there's the inflow, which is the connection from the LV to the pump, the actual pump where there's the impeller, and outflow from the pump to the aorta. Um, external parts, the drive one is actually the connection between the inside and the outside. Um, it's literally wires that connect the internal pump to an external controller. Um, again, this is what it looks like coming out of the abdomen of a patient, and it needs like very meticulous sterile care, um, as you can imagine, a big source of infection for the patients, which is a common, relatively common problem um, they might be coming to the ER with. Um, the controller is uh, literally an external computer that um, has parameters on it, like power, flow, cardiac output, battery life. So these are all things that you're gonna be interested in as a practitioner someone's coming to you with a problem. These are some examples of different models of controllers. And then there's um, the batteries. Um, they are external to the patient. They also plug into the controller. Um, and patients are given multiple extra batteries. They're taught how to change their batteries. They're taught how to change the controller itself. They're given an extra controller. And Again, it's many thousands of dollars in, in equipment, and I guess technically we're expected to know how to manage those issues as well. Just another depiction, again, of the, of the connection, again, from the LV to the pump to the aorta. And another one. All right, so let me see if this will work. Just a couple of quick video clips. This is a surgical. To the LV apex. The coring knife is used to remove the LV apical core. Care is taken to properly orient the coring knife parallel to the interventricular septum. 
Once the apical core is excised, inspect the LV cavity for thrombus and trabeculae that may impede proper positioning of the LVAD inflow can. The inflow conduit is lower and tied. The inner ring of the LVAD inflow conduit is removed. The LVAD is brought up to the field and inserted into the left ventricle. Care is taken to make certain that the LVAD inflow cannula is flush with the conduit. The pre-existing inflow conduit suture is tied. Plastic tie bands are placed around the conduit to secure the LVAD. About that part would you use it tied? Upflow <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> <laughs> portion of the LVAD to help with de airing and decompression of the left ventricle. Next, a side biting clamp is placed on the proximal and lateral aspect of the ascending aorta. The outflow graph is measured and trimmed to appropriate length. Care is taken to make sure that the graph is...
hitting home that you have to pay attention to the parameters. That's what's going to give you hints as to what pathology is going on, along with your bedside echo. So there are, unfortunately, um, many um, models. Um, and we're probably, if you're going to see patients, it's mainly going to be patients that um, have devices implanted that can last for months to years, or else they wouldn't really be going home. Um, more specifically, the years, the three most common ones are these three models. The Jarvik 2000 looks like this. Um, it's a very small pump. This is Dr. Jarvik. Anyone recognize him? Yeah, he was on a tour commercial, which was then pulled from the market because um, he's not actually a practicing medical doctor. <coughs> At this point, he's like a biomedical, almost a biomedical engineer. <coughs> heart pumps, LVADs, and, and things like that, but he never did a residency. Um, this is the HeartMate 2, also axial pump, and this is HeartWare, um, a centrifugal pump. So a little bit of a reality check if you haven't gathered already. Um, in real life, LVAD patients are a patient population that requires many resources. They have a team of practitioners, um, medical cardiologists, surgeons, dietitians, physical therapists, nurse practitioners, uh, biomedical engineers um, that are helping to take care of them on a daily, weekly basis. So when somebody comes into the ER, if, especially if you're not comfortable, um, you should be making contact with their team basically right away. And that, because that's who's going to going to help you <coughs> determine what the problem is and what to do about it. Um, so phone a friend and do it early. Um, all the LVAD patients should carry or there should be a sticker on the device with um, phone numbers. All right, so some quick pearls. Will they have heart sounds? No. Will it be complete silence? No. Radio silence. <laughs> Yeah, you should, hear, you should hear the motor. If you don't hear the motor, you're in trouble. Um, will they have a pulse? No. And they have continuous no. Okay, good. So 95% of patients who have a continuous uh, monitor won't have a pulse. Again, there's no creation of the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure if you don't have a pulse of tile flow. Um, are they alive? Well, so you might not be able to get a heart rate, you might not be able to get um, slash pulse, you might not be able to get a blood pressure on them. So it seems pretty scary. Um, how do you determine their blood pressure? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Alright, so you can you can attempt the automated cuff if they happen to have a pulse tell um, pump. You, you might be able to measure um, a blood pressure. If you can pop an A line in quickly, that's sort of a better gold standard, and it's going to give you the math reading. And then, again, not a systolic or diastolic blood pressure. And if you can't get an A line in quickly, um, you uh, can use a Doppler and a blood pressure cuff. You can the brachial artery. Um, just listen for the first sound you hear, and that's also the patient's math. So just remember their math. So when you get a map of six, or when you measure at 65, you're not freaking out. That's that's normal. Um, and again, the Goldilocks sort of map measurements is probably between 75 and 85. But these patients are both preload preload sensitive and afterload sensitive. So you really want to try to keep them in the Goldilocks range. Um, higher maps, they're they're at risk for stroke. Um, and pump failure, lower maps, poor preload, and also at risk for pump failure, poor flow. Any questions about that? All right, some other pearls. Um, just like mechanical heart valves, um, they can be prone to hemolytic anemias. Um, they're also going to be anticoagulated on warfarin. Generally, the INR is going to be between 1.5 and 2.5, but there's 
every center has even a somewhat intricate protocol on anticoagulation. So talk to their team. Um, and they can have acquired von Willebrand's deficiency since von Willebrand is a big molecule and it can also be broken down by the pump. Uh, remember von Willebrand's factor um, helps with platelet aggregation and is a cofactor to factor eight. So when patients, these patients get acquired deficiencies, um, it's an indication that they transplant them faster um, because without removing the pump, you're not going to fix the problem. And then just to reiterate, um, the patients are very preload dependent. So if their math is low, you want to give them fluids um, to try to tank them up. Uh, if they have right heart failure, or if they develop right heart failure, that can be a particular problem. 20% of patients will develop right heart failure and have pump, LVAD pump failure because of that reason. Um, but you want to protect the RV as much as you can. And high afterloads reduce pump output as well. So you want to have a meticulous control of, of blood pressure. And this is just a graph that shows you that um, for two of the more common pumps that you see, long-term pumps, heart rate and heart wear, um, for any given speed that's set, let's say you have your heart rate set at 9,000 RPMs, um, if your pressure difference is 60, your cardiac output is, let's say, about four 